Good day, everyone. I'm Karen Bonadio, Director of Alumni Relations, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Alumni Talk Policy webinar, Democracy Today in the United States, Our Choice, Our Challenges. The Alumni Talk Policy webinar series features HKS alumni in panel discussions about pressing public issues. While we cannot meet in person, technology allows us to convene virtually, and we appreciate your patience as we navigate this event remotely. This webinar is being recorded and closed captioning is available. I'm happy to introduce the moderator, Khalil Bird, MCMPA 2003, founder and CEO of Invest America, who will kick off today's important and timely discussion. KB. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate Karen, you and your team giving us the opportunity to talk about this subject. So I, I, what I'm gonna want us to do is try to do it in a way that uh, isn't the norm. We're not gonna be depressed. This panel has put, been put together because each of the people have been in action in the preservation, restoration, and building of the health of democracy, mostly in the United States, but we're bringing in the international perspective also. And I'm excited about that. So let me start out um, with a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, we have Daniela Ballou Ayers, who is the founder and CEO, she wouldn't want me to say that, co-founder and CEO of Leadership Now Project. Um, Daniela is not only a graduate of Harvard Kennedy School, but Harvard Business School. We also have Rai Barkat, who has took his business career and made the decision to co-found with David Gergen with Honor, which is an organization that is helping to elect next generation veterans to Congress and beyond. Um, and then we also have our good friend, Catherine Kluver Ashbrook who uh, graduated from the MPA program in 2010, I think I have that right, and is the CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations. She's also had roles at the Kennedy School in policy, and she'll share a little bit about her work here and there. Um, few statistics, and this is the worrying part. Edelman just released its trust barometer for 2022. And one of the things they said is that in countries where you have stated democracy, trust levels in institutions in that democracy are low. Trust levels in authoritarian democracies of their particular countries are higher. That should disturb all of us, especially at a time when younger people are not as attached to the democratic values that we have been trained in for a long time. We'll talk about that. What we know is that in the United States context, only 37% of the people based on a new Axios poll have faith in American democracy. And our good friend, John De La Volpe, who uh, is the polling director at the Kennedy School and the IOP, and also is one of the world's experts in how younger people are thinking about this. What we know is that uh, there was a much higher turnout of young people with regards to the last election. And, but the challenge is, um, their, their lack of trust in institutions, leadership is creating a different kind of politics in the United States um, that's challenging us. So this is a vital conversation. Personal note, um, I came from the Kennedy School of Graduation and my start in politics was being the communications for Deval Patrick's winning campaign for governor in 2005. Uh, it's nice to win on your first election. 10 years ago, I ran a $50 million organization with the goal of creating an alternative to the nominating processes of the Republican Democrats and putting a bipartisan ticket on the ballot, presidential ballot in 2012. I wouldn't have called myself a democracy reformer, but that was the beginning of what has been a long path in this particular field. Two disclosures, I'm a member of the New York uh, 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 Committee for Leadership Now. Uh, and I work really hard there, and I'm also on the board of, with Honor. Hopefully, Catherine and I, we have no conflicts, but hopefully we'll be friends going forward. So we're going to start out this way, uh, on, a, on both grounding us in where we are, but also on a hopeful note. So Dylan, Daniela Blue Ayers of Leadership Now is going to talk about her organization of business leaders focused on democracy, and also give us the state of play based on the research and insights that they're creating at Leadership Now. Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much, KB, and thanks to everyone for being here today. I 
it couldn't be more timely <clears throat> for good or for bad to be having this conversation. Uh, the quick snapshot on Leadership Now, uh, we're an organization founded in 2017, a business and thought leader is committed to renewing American democracy, protecting it. Uh, unfortunately, the protecting part has been uh, a, a big part of our work over the last several years. And our members do three, and we're really focused on empowering our members to uh, be leaders as, uh, as citizens at, in their companies and beyond in their networks on these issues. We do two things. We work with academics. Uh, we started with Harvard academics, uh, Michael Porter or David Gergen or others, um, and now academics across the country to get our members smart on the issues and really understand what's at stake. Uh, we organize our members around uh, uh, issues and advocacy on, on the political side, whether that's pushing back on state level legislation in Texas against voting rights or um, uh, pursuing federal legislation on these issues. And we help our members make better investments of their time and money uh, for democracy. Uh, I won't go in too much depth. I will say, you know, as, as KB member, our founders were uh, our founding member group was our business school and Kennedy School alums. Uh, and now, so there's a strong grounding in um, building on the Harvard networks and the academic work, but now we've grown much more. So we have relationships with 10 universities across the country from University of Texas to Stanford and others to give that grounding to our members and, the, and alumni. Uh, and uh, we've really seen significant action you know, starting in 2020 of our members as public voices um, in the business press and beyond around the importance of democracy and how we need to respond. So I'm gonna share a few stats around where we are right now um, and what we're seeing. And uh, all of our panelists uh, have lots of depth to bring <laughs> to this discussion about the state of play. Uh, so, you know, I always like to start with a, a, some data, right? So, look, the reality is, is our democracy is in trouble. Uh, I do think there's hopeful paths, which we'll talk about, but I think grounding in the data, as KB started to speak to, we do have 17% of Americans who only 17% really have a deep trust in government. A third of Americans um, believe uh, there was voter fraud in the election in 2020, a number that has remained sticky since uh, since January 6th, effectively. Uh, we had the most money ever spent in political races in the 2020 cycle, 14 billion. And America's standing as a democracy globally continues to slip by multiple rankings. And there's many factors you can look at uh, on this, um, none of which till the whole picture alone, I'll, I'll, I'll do a few. So the, you know, uh, the left-hand side are those, is the trust data from Pew. Uh, you'll see if you go back even further, back to the 60s, we were up at 60 or 70%, uh, but we continue to see decline uh, today and a little bit of an uptick, but a week. And then secondarily, the second chart looks at the relationship between uh, uh, adoption of uh, policies and what the general public likes. So the, the blue, the blue line shows the um, correlation between what would effectively be kind of elite preferences and public policy and the potential that it's adopted. The yellow line is kind of general public preferences. And essentially what it says is there's no correlation between public preferences and the adoption of policy. And that's been the case for the last, um, this is from 2015 data. Uh, so people are frustrated. They don't trust the system to deliver for them. Um, and we're seeing this kind of growing uh, polarization in Congress, right? So this looks, this chart kind of dynamically looks at the kind of median Democrat versus median Republican in Congress and their positions. And, you know, going back, you would have had a lot more overlap. Um, but now we see that there's this kind of growing divide and it would be even further with most recent data. Um, and, you know, we're seeing kind of this growing, I think, significant um, trend of disinformation that's undermining the system. One of those examples was around the 2020 election. Um, there was just a kind of, uh, sorry, this might be animated. Um, there was, you know, really deliberate efforts to discredit the election. Um, we saw that, you know, we worked a lot with the business community to try to kind of tamp down the um, 
kind of uh, questions about the legitimacy of the election. And we saw a lot of convergence around, okay, this is a legitimate election. Um, business will stand for it. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of fraying of that agreement uh, as we come now. And so one of the things we do is try to really empower our members and our partners around what are really, if we go down another level, what is actually going on in democracy? How, how did states rank? We ranked, so it's, I, I'm flipping up here, Texas, which is a D from the rankings we've done. We look at voting, electoral systems, campaign finance, but you know, I, I will note New York is a C, right? So this isn't, you know, when you dig into the data, it's not, and the underlying factors, they're not purely red or blue state, but there are many factors that are making democracy not function in terms of some of the core underlying voting electoral system design. Um, and the last I'll just leave with, you know, we overall see an opportunity for business to engage, um, not only because business is always doing the right thing, sometimes it's doing the wrong thing, like funding of election objectors in Congress, but also because but business and, and business people are a trusted group in this society and are concerned and have a particular obligation to be um, part of uh, fixing it. So uh, hand it back to you, KB, but look forward to this conversation. Thank you. And remember, we'll have Q&A at the bottom of the hour, maybe 35 after. So we, we have some questions, but we want to encourage you to join the conversation. So here's the bio part that I that I held for this point for Rai Barkat. Rai is a uh, next generation veteran having served uh, in Iraq himself. He is a Marine, not a retired Marine. Um, retired never comes into it with that branch of the service. Um, he did uh, create an, a, a, an energy fund and has a very strong uh, background as a social entrepreneur. But Ryan and I got to know each other when I read his book and we were introduced and he began to build with honor, uh, which was an idea that had not been pulled off at the scale that he is uh, making it work. So Ryan, please take it away. Hey, thanks so much, KB. Uh, and great to be here with you, with Daniela, who's a trusted colleague and the Kennedy School, who I really, the school is such an enabler for me uh, throughout my uh, life as a social entrepreneur post uh, Marine Corps. I'll just take a moment and talk a little bit about With Honor and uh, how we think about this kind of moment in time and then look forward to, uh, to hearing from Catherine and, and open it up for the discussion. Uh, with Honor is a cross-partisan organization. I, I co-founded it uh, with David Gergen and another veteran that I had served with in the Marine Corps about five years ago. Our, our mission is really focused on polarization in Congress, a, very difficult program problem. And as Daniela's slides illustrate, one that is, I believe, over the last five years gotten worse, not better, uh, despite uh, our efforts, though I do believe our efforts are a part of a important constructive piece to doing better as a country. Because if our Congress continues in the way that it is, um, we, all of our all of our lives are really at, at stake. So what we do is we focus on finding the common ground. And we do that by using the, the one affiliation that still is a public affiliation and has rising trust across political tribal lines. And that is a uh, service in, in uniform. Um, and so we work with veterans uh, from both parties uh, we are uh, strictly bipartisan. We invest capital 50-50 across party lines. And over the last five years, we've helped build a, a caucus in Congress that is in the House and meets every two weeks called the Four Country Caucus. Those are members uh, who are veterans uh, who have trust across party lines and who take a pledge, uh, the With Honor Pledge, to serve with integrity, civility, and courage and as an organization, we, we have accountability in so far as we look at bipartisan scores, we look at participation in the caucus, and then about 60% of our organization is really policy focused and working with those members in that caucus to actually pass laws. And I've been really pleased with the progress, a lot of laws that you, or a lot of actions that you want, might not necessarily read about in Congress, but are, are really constructive and are in areas that are critically important. Um, over 21 laws passed uh, this last year, about a half a dozen of which focused in, in AI. Uh, a major initiative was advancing uh, an expansion of AmeriCorps, which we saw at the beginning of the, of the year, worked really closely, closely with um, veteran service organizations and another uh, organization led by a, another HKS uh, alum, Voices for National Service, and it actually got done. 
Um, and so I think that's the that's the the sort of silver lining is that there are still relationships that are holding together that are cemented in trust and that we need as we carry forward uh, both in the short term and the the, the long term in Congress. Uh, so I appreciate uh, being here with you all today. This organization certainly would not exist without the Kennedy School. We've also benefited from uh, some of the business schools involvement, Jan Rivkin and Michael Porter. Uh, and others that have taken an active interest in getting more involved and we need more people involved, just being involved, this, the, whether they're business leaders or normal citizens, et cetera, the, you know, it's easy to be apathetic. KB, over to you. Thank you. So these are two examples in the US context of organizations where we are actually recruiting people to serve and lead. You need to learn, it takes courage, especially to operate in a bipartisan context, uh, and especially at this moment. And to be one of the bulwarks of democracy is a difficult thing. We started having very interesting conversations with Catherine, and as you read her work, to talk about how Europeans are viewing the United States. And I know that's a very selfish, self-centered American approach, Catherine. How do you, you know, what do you think about me? <laughs> Enough about me. What do you think about me? But we're at a moment right now with uh, Angela Merkel having stepped off the stage and Boris Johnson being in trouble, where Europe knows that it has a significant position with regards to this conversation and action around democracy. We could name all of the examples. We've got a lot of smart folks. For some of us who are part of the US Council on Foreign Relations, and that's been a very important part of our lives, we'd love to know more about the German Council on Foreign Relations and your particular view of democracy from your seat. Well, KB, thank you. You'd think that a foreign policy organization uh, need not necessarily think about the roots, the fundaments, the uh, tenacity, the structure of democracies around the world, but rather how these democracies relate to one another. But we find ourselves obviously in a very precarious moment. Um, if we look at the uh, events at the Russian-Ukrainian border, the fact that we might have some variant of a land war or land conflict at the heart of Europe. And, and this is particularly salient, I think, to people in my generation. Uh, and as you mentioned, I ran for uh, 11 years with Nicholas Burns at the Kennedy School of the Future Diplomacy Project. And it's salient because um, I grew up in a divided continent. Uh, I was born in Germany in an American military hospital in 1976. And throughout my lifetime, I was, you know, became part of a unified country when I was 13. And you thought that, you know, German Americans of, of my generation or Americans and Germans thought that as Francis Fukuyama uh, basically formulated, we would be heading toward the end of history or as our colleagues at Harvard, Sam Huntington and others formulated, there would be the third wave of democracy and all would be well. And we would be looking down a long sunshiny road of a clear system hegemony that is democracy because it provides economic security and stability and innovative capacities uh, and so forth. And now, as you've noted, that's no longer the case. And it starts with the belief that people have in what is what makes an effective and efficient system. And so as the crisis of democracies that played out on January 6th across German television screens and across European television screens was particularly rife because of course, the strong historic connection, Europe whole and free would have never been possible without the US uh, commitment to the continent. The kind of economic and political success that particularly my home country, Germany has uh, had for the past 70 years, the export champion of the world would not have been possible without the American security umbrella. And yet now we're looking down the road uh, and I think Daniela's um, presentation made it clear that potentially in two years uh, or two and a half years with this next election, with the shifts uh, at the state and federal level in the electoral system, that there's a big question mark uh, behind the integrity and functionality of the United States as a democratic system. And then if you look at what are the foundational acts of the multilateral system that we have thrived under and within, uh, if you read the preamble to the Washington Treaty of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that's absolutely vital right now in preventing, again, this conflict, possible conflict right at the heart uh, of Europe. It is that each member country be a democracy. Uh, and that's also enshrined in Article 2 of uh, the NATO Treaty. 
Uh, and of course, we've also, the Europeans have been violators to a certain degree over these last few years. Poland, Hungary, if you look at the Freedom House Index, they have been slipping down very quickly. Um, also other countries, the Czech Republic has been in play uh, because they are, the Freedom House calls Hungary a transitional hybrid regime. And when it thinks about hybrid, that means it's moving into the authoritarian space. But the division lines are once again the way that we encountered them in the Cold War and the way that I grew up looking at the world between autocracy, autocracies now, uh, and democracies. And the bigger component, of course, is that now we're facing an even more dangerous, precarious world because we have the big power competitions between the three large players, United States, China, and then of course now Russia muscling in in the way that it is to remind us of what it is still capable of. China, the strategic power, Russia, the tactical power at the heart of Europe, um, but nonetheless dangerous. But of course, China now for the first time in a position in the way that the Soviet Union wasn't because it has the economic strengths behind it. And that's what's oddly winning over, to your point exactly, the minds of uh, young people, for instance, in, in certain parts of, of Europe, because China is in these countries, is investing in these countries through the Belt and Road Initiative, is bringing economic prosperity uh, at a speed that democracies cannot seemingly uh, deliver sufficiently. And so there's a moment of danger here that we haven't seen in uh, over the recent sort of historic uh, developments where, where the fusion of democracy and liberal capitalism uh, has been star starkly applied or has been met with the ability of authoritarianism to also, or autocratic structures to also deploy the economic weaponry. Uh, the Soviet Union certainly wasn't able to do that. And that's where the, where the real danger moment comes. And that's why you've seen weakened democracies in Europe be affected by that. So what do we do at the German Council on Foreign Relations? A, we look at these developments. Uh, we link them to foreign policy and foreign policy action. We work on the kind of tools that might be proffered to counter that. And so we've seen at the heart of the European Union, some firmer action taken against the backsliding. Uh, in fact, Hungary and Poland and other countries are paying fines. Poland is paying a fine or supposedly paying fines for dismantling its rule of law on the inside. So that the European Union has come to the point albeit arguably too slow, uh, at defending its own democratic infrastructure internally by forcing, quote unquote, countries to pay up or change and slash change back. So that's what we do at the German Council on Foreign Relations. But it's really very much an extension of the work that I did at the Kennedy School. And I'm delighted to see colleagues and classmates uh, on this call and to go deeper into the thematic conversation this evening. Thank you, Kibi. That's terrific. I think I've got time to just do some quick hit questions for each of our panelists. And we want folks to be ready to sort of come back out with uh, their own questions in the Q&A session uh, about 35 after, if not sooner. So let me start with Daniela. One of the questions that came in early is, what can people actually do on the ground to be helpful? What are the fights that, and what we know about leadership now is that it's organized around regions in some cases, strong cities, but you, you, some of your strongest uh, chapters are Wisconsin, Texas, and other places. How are you thinking about your members doing work on the ground? And uh, give us a couple of examples of where business leaders have really stepped up over the last couple of years on the democracy front. Absolutely. Um, look, and there is a lot happening at the local level right now. And it's something that, uh, I think there's so much opportunity for engagement. So uh, let me just talk about kind of, you know, the different ways that we think about political engagement, right? So there's um, money, <laughs> right? Whether small contributions or large contributions, it's actually mostly of what the political system asks you to do. It asks you to, to put money. There's a need for money to, to work on issues of whether it's uh, turning out voters, helping support, strong members of Congress, et cetera. I'm not saying there's no need for money. However, there's it, money alone is not going to go ahead and get us out of this mess. Um, and so overall, when we think about what does it mean to be engaged as a, as a citizen, um, you know, the, the very basics of engagement are engaging at your local level, right? So that means um, 
whether you decide to show up at a school board meeting or to you know, start to understand what the local structures are for a town council. We have members who are on their town councils who had never been engaged in their kind of local politics before. And we're seeing a lot of fights right now happening at the local level around, um, you know, everything from who runs for election administrators um, in their um, in their state um, or, or community um, to, who you know, who kind of oversees the overall election process, which is secretaries of state. So I'm really encouraging people to really start to dig in and understand what their local political structures, who represents you in your state legislature, who represents you locally, et cetera. You can meet with your legislature, you can meet with the, the person who represents you. So whether that means someone running for office or just uh, participating locally. I think second is really knowing, um, you know, we really work with our members to know what their agenda is. Um, and so our agenda has really been on the core of democracy, you know, and it, I'll give an example in Texas, one of our members is a senior executive at a company there she's also on the um, greater Houston partnership which is like the chamber in Houston, and, and she's really been a leader in getting the business community to um, both engage on voting legislation that was occurring at a state level and making their position known that access to vote was really important, as well as doing things like giving time off for voting for employees. Um, but, you know, so there are things you can do if you have a broader platform uh, like that. But even as an individual, you playing a role in your local community can be really important. And I do think, while I think many issues are important, whether it's climate change, racial equity, et cetera. But I do think if we lose whatever issue you care about, if you can also make part of your focus, we work with climate groups, for instance, part of the focus is a functioning democracy. We can't get good legislation um, unless we have a functioning democracy. Start bringing that issue to the table locally or with other issue groups you're involved in. Thank you. Ryan, I'm gonna to come to you. Uh, look, nobody believes that bipartisan is possible. And then every once in a while, an infrastructure bill will pass and people will be puzzled at how that could happen. But the four country caucus supported by With Honor has to work in that way, which is tough. So talk about getting policy done. Talk about the strains that there are and members trying to hold the line as they're meeting every two weeks. Um, and what kinds of things are you trying to move over the line over the next year? Sorry, you're on mute. Thanks, KB. Uh, Daniela started by showing us some data. There's um, an Axios article that came out today that, that looks at the intensity of impressions around members of Congress. And it also illustrates the, the, just the challenges of this problem. The top 10 are the biggest bomb throwers. They're the ones that attract the attention. You know, in journalism, uh, there's the saying, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, it's, it's, it, so it's attracting not only attention, but then this small dollar mechanism, which is reinforcing bad behavior. And we're trying to be a, a ballast in this space. Um, like with most productivity in, in life that happens around teams and diverse teams, um, it does come down to trust. And trust is hard. It can be undermined very quickly. It often takes a lot of time to, to build. It takes in person, which COVID further complicated. And um, the structures are, are really flawed from the very beginning. So in the first hundred days of a new member to in Congress, um, there are about six of those hundred days where they're actually together with members from the other political party. A couple of those happen to be a, a Harvard tie through the Harvard uh, uh, Kennedy School program. If the members show up, and we've had more challenges in recent years getting um, GOP members there in the same level of volume, as, as run, by, run by our friend David King. Can't, right. can't have a call right. without talking about it. Yeah, yeah, and really, like, really helpful. I mean, I remember um, uh, two years ago the the COVID COVID derailed one last year, I believe. But two years ago, I remember sitting in this meeting, and um, two of the members that were talking to each other across party lines, and one of the mem what there was another member that wasn't there, and I just thought to myself, if they were actually there. Um, the Twitter war would not have happened before they at least talked to each other 
in face, face to face, because once you shoot at each other on Twitter, it's, you know, good luck getting anything, anything done. So going back to your question of really, how do we do it? It's, it's, it takes, it takes a lot of effort. It takes some accountability, you know, each, it's not just you sign the pledge, you forget about it. You sign the pledge every two years, you look at what your bipartisan score is. Do you show up to 80% of the meetings? We watch what's being posted on Twitter. If you if you're if you're starting to cross that subjective line of civility, we pick up the phone and make a phone call. We let people leave the group if they're not conforming to the norms. That's a really important piece to it. And what we found is that you still have, you know, it's it's it goes back to that old Margaret Mee quote that now like McKinsey and, and all these other uh, companies are borrowing of the power of a small group when you do have cohesion can get a lot done, especially in a in a, in a polarized environment. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet, but I am saying that there's there's um, there's some some hope for optimism and that the the members themselves matter. Leadership still matters. The sort of individuals matter. You have to address structural problems, but we also need leadership. And um, and so that's that's our approach and our sort of slice of the pie. We're we're only in uh, in the house right now. We're only with uh, military vets, but uh, but with time, potentially we're able to branch into other forms of service. Um, and we do a lot of work on uh, with specific Senate offices to actually pass legislation for the country. And David Gergen is highly, highly involved with both organizations here. So, Captain, this is what what your task is, is we, we want to get to the questions of the audience. We've got some building up here. Um, we're going to ask you to sum up world history in just a couple of minutes. And the question, one of the questions that came through is, are there examples that you can point to of countries that were entrenched in authoritarianism or worse that have been able to make the steps toward? Or are there countries you're seeing now where you're hopeful, especially within the context of the EU and NATO? Well, I mean, the obvious examples, and we're seeing this uh, literally play out every day with um, new promises made to inc increase the commitment uh, to strengthening, particularly the NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization are the, are the Baltic countries, right? Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and Estonia all host to uh, forward present troops that are not of their own nationalities, which is to say enhanced forward presence is uh, a mission that's been uh, in, in situ on a rotating basis with American and Canadian participation for a number of years, sort of holding the line. Uh, and I think you are, will be hard pressed to find more um, westernized former uh, Eastern Bloc countries than, than the Baltics. Uh, and that is a very stable and steady democratic transformation. However, Poland, as much as, of course, uh, they are transatlanticists, they are, in fact, if you will, more transatlanticists than they are pro-European, because you've really seen and I remember uh, a trip to Poland about six years ago when they had just decided to remove the EU flag from every official building. You know, that was sort of the death by a thousand cuts and then the rapid dismantling of Polish democracy to, dis democracy to where we are now, I think is in a really precarious position. But because I need to leave you on a hopeful note as we go into uh, Q&A and because Danielle noted um, and Raya also the power of the local and the power of surfacing what works and connections that work. We have a Hungarian election coming up in early April, 2022. And despite the fact that Viktor Orban dances large across that country such that uh, the Conservative Action Committee wants to hold a summit there because he is now a revered leader. I mean, the perversity of that, I'll, I'll, I'll let that go, but Viktor Orban has become a figurehead for American conservatives. It's extremely tricky in my mind. But that being said, he's facing an opposition by the mayor of Budapest, uh, who has had, well, had over the pandemic, but that really um, it became something that was very much stepped up, uh, part of uh, the Visegrad for mayors, which is to say uh, mayors from Eastern European countries that bound together in uh, particularly this resource crunch around the pandemic where national governments were denying them the big liberal cities at the pulsating hearts of these transforming backsliding countries uh, had, had organized together on WhatsApp on American technology um, to really deliver services for their citizens. And that made 
uh, the mayor of Budapest, a household name across the country, such that he is now in a position to be running against Viktor Orban and his numbers don't look too, too bad, uh, not at this moment in time. So um, look, go, looking back at Danielle's slides, if 17% uh, of Americans only you know, trust in their government and Congress's trust in Congress has been consistently backsliding where we always see hope is in the local level and in trust in our mayors and our, our local authorities. And that is true across the Western world. So if we need a narrative that strings people's lives together, that makes clear what community means, that is something that I think in the West uh, unites us in our common humanity. Um, so if we're having a bad day, that's where we need to look. But then that's also, again, the call to action. I think that you've so usefully underlined, we need to start always uh, in front of our, our doorstep, our front door. It's a great, great summary. Karen, I think that you're gonna help uh, with the calling out of questions for individuals. Let me know, I've been sort of monitoring some of the questions and I'm ready to sum up, but do we have anybody who's ready to step to the mic? Um, we're, we would like to promote Wei to ask the first question. He asked it in the, or excuse me, Wei to ask the first question who um, asked it in the chat. I see them. If you'd like to turn on your video and Turn on your mic. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I want to thank you for just this talk. It seems really in time. Um, I have had discussion with uh, many friends locally here. I mean, Houston uh, belong to a local club, a uh, Harvard club here. Uh, I was uh, with the JFK in 2011 and then uh, business school 2018. Um, I guess. Uh, I want to first make a comment about uh, thanks uh, for uh, Catherine mentioning about China. Democracy, you know, is uh, about United States, the, the, you know, the light of the world. And I'm originally from China. Um, as we all know, you know, um, what happened to Soviet Union and become Russia now. And then with China is, you know, number two world economy. And so many people talk about uh, what's the future of China, right? Then we look at Soviet Union Maybe it's Ch today's China, but uh, what about Russia today? Is it look better or United States democracy is any better? So the last election, I mean, the whole world and not whole world, at least Chinese people have think, uh, wow, that's definitely not the solution. And so the discussion about the future of American di di uh, diplomacy, uh, really uh, a lot of Chinese or people like me in this country uh, care about not just America, but also future maybe for China and other people. And so the problem recently um, I heard uh, from Andrew Yang, you know, who was the uh, presidential candidate um, uh, 2020. So he talked about the democracy problem is a two party system and make people are become extreme. Uh, on both end and right now so many people feel they could not choose any candidate they can only choose the so-called the, the second worst, right? And so Andrew Young talked about maybe third party, independent party. So people who have reasonable mindset like you and me who think you know, reasonably and maybe to um, help or motivate or whatever, make the candidates do something reasonable. He used the example uh, in Alaska. Alaska, there's a senator she uh, voted against Trump. Uh, the reason she did that, because, uh, according to Andrew Yang, that uh, Alaska had made uh, uh, election reform so that uh, she would not risk her own election uh, in, in terms of her decision. So what do you think about the, having the, another party in the United States? Because it seems like two party system may be into some uh, dilemma. And then according to uh, constitution- So uh, wait, wait, yeah. wait, I'm gonna go ahead and, and summarize it into two questions because I want our okay. panelists to get in here. I really appreciate it. So Daniela, talk about uh, the seduction of a potential two party system. And I think one of the questions I'll pass it from Daniela to Catherine is, is there a post-democracy democracy that we can, the democracy, democratic system that we can imagine that we should be envisioning? Um, so, Daniela, why don't you start out with third parties in the U.S.? Uh, look, it's a, it's a good question. I, you know, I'm going to uh, give an answer that's maybe like not totally satisfying on this, which is we have seen like what we're facing right now is both a systems challenge and a talent problem, right? Like 
we we definitely need fixes to the system, right? So some of what Andrew is talking about is like introducing ranked choice voting, right? Into the system that allows for more flexibility for um, third party candidates or independents. Um, and I think there's, and then things like gerrymandering is another area that's creating all kinds of polarization. There are very significant systemic reforms that we need to kind of address this challenge and like counter the extremes. But I also think like the reality is, is we don't have time to fix all of that before we kind of make sure we have like the right, like people and talent in the system making decisions. And that's going to happen through a mix of getting good people into the Democratic and Republican Party who are like courageous and committed and, you know, so the type of work Rai is doing that are willing to kind of represent a broader base for either party because right now the primaries you know primaries are a huge issue you get the extremes showing up and you get extremes kind of representing so i'm not opposed to the idea of a third party emerging but at the end of the day parties or factions of parties which we have right now we have you know a trumpist faction in the republican party we have a progressive faction in the democratic party building factions of parties or building a new party is really about organizing people against a goal. And so it's not a theoretical thing. Like I, I think efforts to kind of build, you know, potentially third parties, et cetera, should be tested, right? And people should go and start building that. But there's also the path of building stronger, you know, elements of the Democratic and Republican Party who are more courageous, you know, more committed to representing a broader base of the public that I think has to be pursued at the same time. So Catherine, one of the one of the things that a question came through, I'll combine ways inquiry to someone else is it's that we don't actually live in democracies. The United States is a, is a republic, it's a representative democracy and people don't trust their representatives right now or, or we, we, don't, we don't trust them as much as we did before. And the question is, as younger people are putting pressure on leadership and thinking about things in different ways and perhaps sometimes going in directions that make, make us uncomfortable. Should we be thinking about experiments in, around democracy? Will it look different in 50 years than it does now? This is where I would, you know, love to have the, the MPA class of 2010 lining up behind me uh, as we might do in a forum event, because this is where I would get out of the way and let my Austrian classmate, Josef Lenz, who works on innovation and democracies, come into the conversation um, because he's looked very clearly at uh, or his organization uh, has looked at exactly what is happening in the party political space, particularly in more in more multi-party democracies, um, you, starting with his native Austria, where uh, you did have a sort of midway party spring up, uh, Neos, out of nothing, uh, a sort of liberal economic party uh, that platformed on this idea of how you recapitalize on the idea of combining participatory democracy. So similar to what Emmanuel Macron did in France to launch his, his, his party, which is to, to do effectively in some regard what uh, Daniela and, and Rise uh, organizations are, which is to go take the problems, the big questions to the people, feed that back, build your platform around that. And then, you know, with having, having done that act of listening and connecting, go forth and, and make plans. That same structure has worked in a number of countries uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. The fact of the matter, and that's why the French election in, in April will be so interesting, is that's worked for a time. And so I think to get to your question is, are there experiments happening in democracy and in, in places of established and resilient democracies? Absolutely, they are. Uh, are they sufficient to kind of push democracy or the development of democracy forward such that that takes root, that it works towards cementing democracy is another question. My great concern is, if that's true, what you're postulating, KB, is that, you know, we have a whole new generation of Democrats, uh, you know, and in terms of uh, democracy, not Democrats, in terms of the party coming up and bringing up the rear that will be feeders for the organizations that we're discussing today, then that's wonderful. I, I, in the American, in the context of the United States, because of the system, you know, you never saw on the chair that builds your own power that supports your own power. And that's why, you know, when Europeans or Germans ask me, my God, gerrymandering and 
um, and election officials, you know, you just have to have the federal government take over and get rid of all of that. Well, that takes, you know, the change we know it takes. And so that there's a bizarre greed for power that's playing out, I think, in the most perverse sense in American democracy right now is is tricky and 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 really difficult. Uh, and I think then again, in the European context, what worries me is that there you have a whole generation of young people. It's in uh, the work of my good Harvard colleague or who was at Harvard for a long time is now at um, Johns Hopkins. Um, now, of course, I'm having a, a oh, Yasha Monk, um, you know, who, who has said, look, there are generations of men 30 and under who think, why not embrace an authoritarian or more authoritarian system seems to work real well and quote unquote, create the efficiencies we need to move forward. And it's not ideological and Oxford has done research on this as well, Timothy Garton Ash and others. It's not ideal ideological, it's based around business efficiencies, effectiveness and efficiencies in systems delivery. And so I do think in that sense, President Biden is, is truly onto something when he leans into that and connects that uh, into the um, uh, uh, foreign policy for the middle class bit, because that is the narrative, that practical narrative that we're going to have to take forward, both here and there, but in Western style democracies to, to make that sticky again for the generations that come after us. Thank you so much, Karen. I think we have another question. Yes, and please remember that all questions end in a question mark. Next question comes from Lucy. Unmute. Hi. Hi, KB. Lucy. So um, a couple of quick comments and then uh, a, a question. And thank you all for putting in the time to do this. Well, uh, hopefully as quick as possible. We've got about yep, four other got people it. we want to get in. Got it. Got it. And we when we have and time is tick talking. Um, in terms of, you know, bad news the, of um, what's knocking down democracy, both here in the United States and internationally. Just a couple of other things. One is the polarization of wealth. Um, we know that any time that there's an extractor class that is sucking up all the resources, and the, the more that income inequality grows, the less democracy thrives. That's one. The, um, the second is the presence of a, of a political party without a platform, but instead is organized around identity which is what unfortunately too much of the, of the Republican party is now morphing into right now. They don't have a platform, they won't say what they're for, but all they are about is some amorphous sense of frankly, white um, supremacy uh, identity politics. Um, the third thing I would say, however, um, as, as a counterbalance to that, I, I think that while everybody's having fun beating up on the US, we are the, probably the first place on earth that is really trying to make a play at becoming a multiracial, multiracial, multi multicultural democracy, really for the first time. And, um, and our history here has been every time that we've tried to expand the franchise, really, and to expand uh, uh, participation in democracy, really, it has always been met with violent backlash against abolitionists. So Lucy, I just wanna, uh, we, we got the point. So let's get the okay. question. So the question that I have is, um, what do I do living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where every elected official that I have access to is solidly in the camp of pro, doing pro-democracy development? So working at, the, working at the community level is just redundant. Um, what, what does, a, what does a, a, a politically engaged activist from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts do to try to help in Texas or North Dakota or the Carolinas? Um, so Rybarka, um, help us help us coastal elites um, out a little bit. You know, what do we need to do to, and what is being done to have real conversations in the real world? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, listen, it's it's uh, it's hard, but you gotta you gotta take active steps to to bust out of the bubble and your own bubble. Uh, we're all prisoners of our own perspective and. And just try and form those relationships. I think one of the most helpful ways, just on a practical level, is to is to think about you know family members. Um, if you have family members that have thought differently from you, you know maybe go down that turf in a way that's personal, and you know you can do it in person and take a walk and just try and understand each other. It takes time. It takes effort to invest in that. That's why I think starting with somebody that you already have some trust with is probably uh, probably helpful. But there's no. There's no silver bullet. I do think that there's that it's you know we are on this trajectory where if we just keep shutting down the conversations, which is easier to do in society given our 
the techno technologies that we now use to communicate, um, we can be going down a, a really, um, you know, we're going down a pretty perilous path if we don't figure out some some conversations that can start locally. So I don't have a great answer for you other than uh, <laughs> other than uh, to work on it both in a personal way and then get maybe get involved with organizations, whether they're uh, you know nonpartisan, bipartisan organizations that are just trying to trying to find some of that common ground and then start with the common ground, use that to build some trust and see where you can go from there. Let's talk about that because the issue now Daniela has a program of identifying candidates and issues. How do you how do you do that for your membership is all over the country. Yeah, I mean, look, one thing I just want to suggest is I, I think one of the things uh, politics has lost in a big way is that like really organized constituencies are kind of have been the heart of politics, right? So whether that's environmental groups, whether it's a local, you know, whether those are organized by geography, by issue, by profession, by affiliation, right? So I would think about, you know, you don't have to, you know, geography isn't the only axis that you can be organized around, right? So really thinking about, you know, we're really, um, we're seeing emergence of more, you know, historically you have like the NAACP and labor unions and others, Common Cause. I mean, I think it's a great organization. It's present across the country. You could join and participate, I think. The other thing is we're seeing alumni, you know, part of what we've looked at and part of what we're doing is organizing alumni networks. There is a group called Crimson Goes Blue, which is, Harvard alums who are Democrats and organizing together, right? And supporting across the country, different candidates and causes, et cetera. I, I think the using your various affiliations, both to organize um, I, and, and there's great women's groups also that are, are working on these issues. So I feel like that's the heart of what we need is a lot more organizing um, and you know a lot more engagement and getting smart together with like-minded people. And that doesn't have to be only by geography. Thank you. Next question, Karen. Yes. Next question comes from Jovan. And Joe, we're running out of time. So if you could, let's get in there in and out pretty quickly, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, I will be really brief and uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in regards from Belgrade, Serbia, and I have questions to my classmate, Katrin. We graduated in 2010 MPE program. And uh, in the meantime, I was Serbian ambassador to Indonesia and ASEAN and also a member of Serbian parliament. And uh, since she knows very well both the US foreign policy and EU foreign policy, can, can you envisage a concerted US EU approach towards authoritarian regimes, especially uh, in Europe, uh, EU candidate countries? Uh, having in mind the changes uh, in the German government and having now a traffic light coalition. So do we expect any changes in German foreign policy, uh, particularly in these authoritarian EU candidate countries like Serbia with significant uh, Chinese and Russian foothold or geopolitical issues would still prevail because such a stabilocracy approach not based on fundamental Euro European values has been contributing to raising Euroscepticism in these candidate countries and opened additional room for these other geopolitical actors. I'm thank gonna you. make it as fast as possible, KB. Thank you, uh, Don. It's so good to see you and be in this conversation virtually. I think very quickly, I think it, very concretely, uh, the German traffic light coalition has, of course, vowed to uh, lean into this issue more actively. And one way to do that, and I'm just going to give you this one little nugget, and you're very aware of this anyway, but it might be worth sharing in the context of this conversation, is that the European Union gave itself at the end of December a beefed up way to push back against the Belt and Road Initiative, because we know that BRI funding comes with a narrative around how China is going to, or China will steer uh, the kind of investments in critical infrastructure and then claw back value. Um, and <clears throat> with Global Gateway, with 300 billion euros on the table, uh, there are ways in which there are a number of projects where you could uh, connect uh, American infrastructure ambitions uh, and American development dollars with that kind of plan. So I have argued in, an, in another piece that I just wrote for Merrick's, a very short piece, um, that, that deals with China policy uh, primarily, that that is one of the areas in which early in 2022, you need to put legs below it, um, below that initiative, because you're absolutely right. The, the, the perception 
of investment in Western Balkan countries of Chinese and Russian money versus what the European Union has actually pumped into the development of Western Balkan countries is, of course, fully akimbo. And that needs to be corrected. And one of the ways that can that it can do that more stringently is by realigning priorities and bringing uh, both sides of that transatlantic peace in line. I don't think it's going to be enough. I worry it's not gonna be fast enough given how distracted we are by the current crisis, um, but that would be a very concrete initial way in which to do it, certainly in the first six months uh, of the year ahead. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. The team, and I know Rick, you're, you're up with a question. The team has said that uh, if any of the panelists want to uh, stick around for a few minutes that we can go over a bit, but, but we're gonna end on time. So this is what I'm gonna do. I wanna, I wanna direct a quick question to Rai and a, a quick question to Daniela. Um, to Rai, my, my classmate, Jim Craig, who's also a, a veteran, said he's disturbed by the idea that we are elevating military service above other types of service uh, in the country. And we know with honor has been involved with the national service piece. You mentioned this a little bit, but I want you to dig in on this just a little bit. And for Daniela, um, what I'm hoping is that um, you can actually amplify on a question in the chat and talk a bit about um, uh, what Lucy was talking about. We're a messy country that's trying, that's struggling with diversity. The question is, do we have a cultural challenge with regards to holding our democracy? And in the end, is that a that is that challenge a good thing? So, Rai, why don't you go first? Yeah, thanks, KB. Listen, I, I think the, the main point to emphasize is that service is difficult and the most effective leaders in politics, which is a tiring and often unforgiving job, are service oriented. They, they, they have egos, <laughs> they, okay? They are willing to, they, 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 they are not purely se uh, uh, selfless, but they are there to serve. And when you've taken an oath and to give up to and including your life, if called to do so, that is a bind that is extremely strong and unique in service. And that's what that's where military veterans come from. Um, we also really applaud and look for other avenues to advance uh, service in the country. It's one of the few issues that has widespread bipartisan support to increase service among our young people in particular, give them something larger to work on and think about than themselves at an early age. It's much like voting. If you start voting early, you're more likely to be engaged throughout your entire life. If you start serving early, you're more likely to be engaged in service. And so this is sort of the continuum. Um, and, and, and then in Congress, the percentage of veterans has declined from around 70% to where it is now around 20%. So it's not just about veterans, it's about the type of, and the quality and ca caliber of those individuals. Um, but that's a, that's a great starting point. And that's the one that we've chosen to, to get up and off the ground and, and supporting these 26 members. So back over to you, uh, Daniela. One minute, one minute for Daniela. Thanks. Um, Look, I think the the cult, one of the foundational cultural problems that we face, which relates to what Raya is talking about, and which is why we all went to the Kennedy School, is that you know the faith in in public servants is very so low. You know, political leaders are rated extremely low in in faith um, of the American public, and so few people want to enter public service and politics because of how you know ugly they feel it is, and. Fundamentally, I mean, I think all of us as alumni of the Kennedy School believe in the value of service. I think there is, if we have to do some things to restore that sense of you have an obligation to your country and your community. We have so many people who feel detached from that uh, right now. And that holds whether you're a veteran, whether you're in business, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a doctor, whether you're someone who's been left out of the system wholly. The, the irony is that I find even those who, who are, you know, have privilege and education and power also feel left out of the system. So if we can restore that um, in small ways and large ways and as quickly as possible in some um, quarters, I think that can get us in the right direction. Catherine, last word, we're over time. Next five years, are we challenged in regards to democracy and the trend line across the world, or are we gonna go into a renaissance? 
We're absolutely challenged, but we need to accept the challenge. We need to see the challenge. We're really ticking down time. I'm talking about 24 months here. And I made that point in an op-ed that I wrote to the German public about American democracy, because again, the health of American democracy is <clears throat> what holds every other multilateral uh, institution together. So the time is ticking. The time to flip the switch to your point about uh, the Renaissance has to be now. But unless people understand the threat that we face very clearly and very acutely, and Russia is helping us understand that, uh, then I am fearful that we're not going to meet that challenge in the time that is racing away from us. So if there's any good in the precarious international situation we find ourselves, it is perhaps to have that focus become more crystallized. Thank you, Catherine Kluver Ashbrook. Thank you, Ray Barkat. Thank you, Demata Blue Airs. Karen, any last words? Yes, I just want to thank you all for joining us today and thank you for all the alumni who participated. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Um, I know it, there was a lot of questions in the chat that it, we didn't quite get to, so we understand that this is um, a to be continued conversation. Um, we look forward to keeping all our alumni engaged in future months and please save the date for our next alumni talk policy on February 22nd for a discussion on housing and homelessness. And for the most up-to-date school news and events, please visit the HKS alumni website. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.